Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, The Follow Spot Operator and Essential Resource presented by AJ Penn. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar, but there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar is also being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. And we do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman and Pro Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to AJ Penn, the presenter for today's webinar. Since the early 1990s, AJ has worked in the lighting industry as a technician, programmer, and designer for feature films, corporate events, and television. Now focusing on live concert production design, AJ is currently working with One Republic and Josh Groban. I'm going to pass it over to you, AJ. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, welcome to everybody out there, whether you're looking at me on a computer or on your big screen TV or on your phone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. If you're here live, I look forward to the Q&A at the end. And if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for tuning in. Thanks again to Martin Harmon for doing these things and to Laura Lawrence for hosting and Brad Schiller for giving me the phone call. Today, I'm going to talk about the follow spot operator and the follow spot and give you a brief history thereof. Um, it is one of the most important and overlooked uh, instruments in the uh, in the whole lighting lexicon these days, I think. And so I'd like to give my thoughts on how to have a successful show and how important that operator is. Um, I'm going to describe my own approach to calling follow spots. And um, <clears throat> this was, I'm saying the way that I do things, and I called a couple of friends to sort of corroborate and see that we're speaking very similar languages. Um, I learned from uh, a few of the best in the business, and uh, I managed to get uh, Ben Richards and Butch Allen on the phone to uh, share their thoughts with me a bit, and it was great. They pointed out a couple things I might not think of, and uh, they reinforced some of the ideas that I've been using for 20 years. Um, I'm going to give you an outline of how we brief for the follow spot show, how you get it ready basically, and I'll perform a few sample follow spot calls. There's also a big difference when you start uh, touring internationally and to, there's a difference between North America and the EU, or EU uh, for follow spot operators. We're going to talk about that. And finally, we'll finish with a discussion of the future of follow spotting, which uh, technology is really changing. So what is a follow spot? <laughs> well, it's a light that follows somebody at the simplest essence. It's a big tin can with a bright light source at one end and a few lenses to direct the beam and some mechanical stuff in between that you use to shape the beam to change the intensity and to uh, change the color. We use the word spotlight as a noun. We also use it as a verb. We say spotlight this person and uh, let's put a spotlight on that. So it means drawing attention to, to uh, any particular thing that you want to see. <clears throat> the expression limelight is used to say someone is has attention on them. They're they're basking in the in the glory of being on stage. It's also a really cool rush song. Well, it came from the first such type of thing as a follow spot, which had a lime uh, light source. Lime quick lime, which is calcium carbonate can be heated to over 4,600 4, degrees Fahrenheit before it melts. And it, it emits a bright white glow. It's on the greenish side if you really look at it, hence the term as, as well, limelight. But um, <clears throat> it's the first time we had a really bright source. Unfortunately, it was difficult to handle. You had to heat it with a burner, so you had to have a set of uh, taps. You're basically controlling a welding torch. Uh, and then there was a mechanical device to turn that cylinder so that you wouldn't burn any part. You could keep it moving and the light would emit. And so it was a very interesting apparatus put together. Um, the, uh, and the light source being a continuous source, 
uh, required some sort of mechanical dimming. So whether it was uh, louvers like you would see on a synchrolite or something akin to the shutters that we see on today's follow spots uh, or dowsers, you need some mechanical way of shutting out the light because the light source never dims itself. <clears throat> the operators of these things way back in the day were referred to often, I found many times them referred to as limes. Um, it was very hands-on operation and I've threw up a few graphics here. Uh, the one on the left there is from a program from the Odeon Theater where they have a lovely paragraph about how the operators of these lighting fixtures are part of a ballet that's all synchronized with the whole harm, harm they're all harmonious with the entire production. And I thought that was kind of cool that they gave uh, credit to the people behind the scenes in this way. Not only would you have some sort of a lighting operator if you were dealing with auto transformers like big levers that you'd have to pull. You might have two or three lighting operators. And then on top of that, you would have these uh, finite resources, these big bright lights in your front of house positions that could be repurposed during the show, not just not just as follows. You'd have one person that might be repos repositioning these lights during the show. So it's a fascinating evolution there as to how these operators got the job. And as you can see from the middle there, the uh, cut of the exploded view of the um, <coughs> strand spotlight, some of the apparatus that we use to change the color and to change the intensity became very complicated. I mean, that, I, that looks like something I would uh, treat with a lot of care if I was operating a, a, a picture like that. So the early operation was very hands-on, more than just follow, spot, follow spotting a, a lead singer on stage. And then we had the carbon arc came along and started becoming the light source. Carbon arc is fascinating to me. You have this constantly burning arc of light between two uh, sticks of carbon that are basically welding rods. Um, it's a very bright and controlled light source as long as you maintain that gap. So there was a motor on the unit that would feed the one stick towards the other as it burned off. So you would maintain that, that arc. They would call the lamp housing the oven. And as you can see in the middle there, that the uh, there's, a, there's a little like black rectangle. That's a little window with welding glass. You would look inside to make sure that you were um, you you had that distance correct and were maintaining the best arc. So the operator had to do a lot more than just point the light and and change the color or whatever. The operator had to make sure that lamp stayed lit. A um, couple interesting things about this: the carbons would only last for about 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, so you would have to budget time into your show to trim out the lights. They would call it trimming, which was the act of uh, shutting the lamp down, opening that oven up, replacing the carbon rod, closing it back up. And presumably you'd have to let it cool down a bit or handle the rods with tools. It was a precarious thing. The best in the business I heard could, it could uh, change the carbons out in about 30 to 40 seconds, which is pretty impressive when you see the machine that they're dealing with. Um, so a way to uh, make sure that uh, some follow spot was always on, you could stagger their lamp start times. So maybe start have one guy fire up his lamp five minutes before the show and then have the next guy fire up his lamp just at this, at when the house lights start. Uh, you might ask them to extinguish their lamps if you knew there was an entire section where a couple of spots weren't used. Uh, and then within the show itself, you'd have to build in these times when like, hey, now is a good time for spot five to trim. So we'll have, have them change their sticks. So there's a, the, the lighting director now had a role in just maintaining the illumination of these follow spots. Uh, my favorite story about this, I was doing a show at the National Arts Center in Ottawa. And we had this old operator, this really experienced guy um, who, he, he made a couple of mistakes during the show. I didn't really say anything. And then he came and apologized afterwards. And, and I, I said, oh, don't worry about it. I forgot about it. And he's like, yeah, you know, I was manually feeding that thing. I didn't understand what this really meant at the time until my friend explained to me, yeah, the motor had broken down on that carbon feed uh, mechanism. So he was turning a knob throughout the entire show just to maintain that arc. At the same time, he was listening to me fade in, fade out, bump to black and change color. So uh, that was quite an impressive feat, and I gained a lot of respect for the follow spot operator on, on that day. 
from car carbons, well, we needed a bright source and stranging out carbons was getting really boring. I mean, we were there. I, I used uh, carbon arc follow spot in 2006. These things are still hanging around. But the xenon lamp made it so that now we had a self-contained replaceable lamp. And it went in the same place in that follow spot that the carbon apparatus went. And now you had the super trooper, one of the more ubiquitous uh, fixtures out there. Um, these lamps are under high pressure xenon gas that the, uh, the, the electrodes that are creating the arc of electricity, uh, they don't burn down as quickly. There's a regenerative process between the inert gas and the, the, the coating on inside the bulb. It's a, a technical um, chemical process I don't really want to get too much into, other than to say when these things explode, they don't go thunk, like a uh, light bulb, on an old-fashioned tungsten light bulb, they explode and shards go everywhere. And I have experience with that too. So when you change these bulbs out, the operators, they need to wear thick gloves and a face shield, um, which they'll be wearing all the time now because of coronavirus. Uh, and uh, these lamps are, it's kind of a, a dangerous but wonderfully versatile light source for the, uh, for, for the follow spot. So that led to the ubiquitous super trooper First carbons, then xenons, so popular that ABBA wrote a song and named an entire album after the word, after the title Super Trooper. Um, the second most common spots you see out there are lysians, and some of them are the same size, the lysian 2500s and stuff. But you see carbon, you see, uh, excuse me, strong super troopers are the, just the, the, the most across North America anyway. Um, the basic design has been unchanged for decades. There's a Super Trooper and a Super Trooper 2. There's not a lot of differences between them. Uh, they operate very similarly to the, to the follow spot operator. Uh, and this general control, control structure with um, three knobs on the top, three levers on the top, and a color changer in the front was generally adopted by other manufacturers as well. Uh, the color changer boomerang on the front is a mechanism where if you've ever operated it, you'll notice that you can drop one lever and it stays in. And then if you select a different lever and drop that in, it cancels the other one. It, they all have a little notch that catch and hold it until you press the next one, which releases all of them. You can have put three frames in and latch them in and then cancel all three of them with, with the change to one frame. Uh, most color changers have some system like this. Not all of them self-cancel, but uh, this design is just fantastic. To the point that we would actually tour with uh, your colors pre-mounted in Super Trooper frames. So you could go to a local venue and just hand them a set of frames and a headset and a belt pack. They take that up to the spots and they would just insert it into their color changers and you call the frames by number so they don't have to know which color is which. And uh, that it made the, the um, setup for the follow spot operators a lot easier to have the touring production provide the metal frames, which would come back to them at the end of the night. Um, <clears throat> the, um, yeah, so besides the ubiquitous super trooper, one very popular spot that is very dear to my heart is the humble Altman Q1000 alt spot. Um, these are the most common spots that I've found around North America exploring attics of old theaters and stuff like that, as well as high schools. And I, my first experience with any follow spot was this guy. We would rent one of these for our big uh, theatrical production uh, at the school I went to, and my first show was West Side Story. I got to run a follow spot. Um, it was a incandescent bulb. So there was literally, our, our unit had, and you can see it in the image on the right there, there's a light switch that you would just flick on and off. You could get a wonderful fade out by just clicking off the light switch and the light would just glow out. Although you can control speed, it worked pretty well. Uh, on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see the Altman color changer arrangement. This was a lot simpler than a boomerang. Same principle with levers, except these ones didn't cancel. So if you wanted to put a new one in and take the other one out, you had to do both operations with your fingers. You'll notice that one of the handles is black, and that black one was just a piece of metal. That was your dowser. So I talked about the mechanical dimming. You could mechanically dim this incandescent source. 
Uh, that way you wouldn't have any color shift as it as it glowed out, but there was no dimmer on it anyway. So you, if you wanted to have less than 100% intensity, you'd either have to put uh, some neutral density in one of those color frames or use the dowser effectively to dim it out. The controls were very intuitive. You see the, hand, the, the rod sticking out the back there. That plunger moved in and out to zoom the fixture and, and achieve the proper edge. And then uh, those, there's two more knobs there under your hand. You could turn it. The outer ring was the, the chopper gate, so you could, top off, you could cut off the top and bottom of your, your light uh, beam. And then the smaller inner handle was actually an iris. So you could change your iris without moving your hand as you were holding the back of the spot. Very intuitive operation. My first big gig on a big rock show was with my very favorite thrust spot, which is the, alt, uh, the excuse me, the Lycian Starlight 1. Not the Starlight 2. The Starlight 1 had the controls in all the right places to be mounted on the truss. You would have your the uh, the back handle rotated, and that was your dowser. So you could have one hand that was moving the light and doing the dimming at the same time that you had your hand over on the color changer, which you can see is mounted not way in the front of the unit, but right next to the operator's head, assuming that they're mounted sitting right next to it on the truss. Uh, the large handle protruding at the side there is the actual zoom. There was no iris. It was a, 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 a optical beam size. So as you iris down, the light would inherently get brighter. Um, so you had a lot of control over this fixture in a, in a very small package. My first gig uh, as a follow spot operator in a big show was uh, actually Don Henley. And I'll never forget it. The LD, who was Steve Cohen at the time, wrote down all our names. I'll talk to you about that later when I talk about spot calling. But this guy wrote down our names, so I was called AJ all night. I didn't have to remember if I was spot two or seven. And I was dead center right above Don on him all night. It was a pretty exciting time. It was back in the days I worked in a non-union house, and uh, when they said, AJ, you've run a trust spot before, haven't you? I just said, well, hmm. I run a spot and I climbed a truss once. So yeah, yeah, I run a truss spot. You can't always get away with that kind of thing nowadays, but uh, back in the day, opportunity knocks and you answer the door. So I fell in love with follow spots right at the beginning of my lighting career. <clears throat> so let's talk about spots in a rock show. Now this webinar would go on for hours if we talked about every single context, whether you're in a theater or doing spots at a festival, corporate stuff. So I want to focus on the idea of the rock show, because again, I, I may have started with West Side Story, but pretty soon I was watching rock shows where they had these LDs running a, a console with 10 fingers and telling eight different people all what to do at the same time, right in time with the music. Um, in these two illustrations here, you can see front light, back light, front light disappearing creates drama. It's a, a light show, a rock show is a very kinetic and dynamic thing. So the only way to do this is to be having humans listen to your commands. How do you speak to these people? Who gets a spot? Let's let me not get ahead of myself. How do you decide how many follow spots in your rig? Do you just say, well, I got five guys on stage? Well, maybe one of them's a drummer or a keyboard player that never moves. Maybe the drummer wants equal billing and wants to make sure they're just as bright as everybody else on stage. So there's a lot of factors that might go into how many spots you specify for your tour. Uh, personally, the, I think the best thing ever is to have two front spots and one rear spot on every single person on stage. That would be incredible. Can't always hire that many operators or hang that many trust spots. Um, and your tour may have only budgeted for two spots on their labor bill. If you are uh, on a budget-minded tour, you might not have the resources to add another operator. Just saying I want an extra spot means you got to pay an extra person that night. So some of the factors are political <laughs> as to how many spots get put on stage, but really it's just you choosing your toolbox. How do you speak to these people during the show? How do you address them? And I'm using address in the sense that you would address a moving light because you need to talk directly to it. Well, a lot of guys are used to using numbers. Standby spot two, spot five do this, spot seven do that. Um, I used to use that 
theory, and I found that over the years, using words can actually have a lot of advantages. I start by taking down their given names. If, if, if anybody's going to answer to any name, it's the one that their mom gave them. So I know everybody's name. If there's two Johns, we go by his last name, maybe, or, or by a nickname. Second, I'm going to give them a target, a default target anyway. They might have to do more than one person, but generally they'll be on one person for most of the show. And I like to refer to that person as both the target and the operator. So I can say singer. Well, if there's two, two spots on the singer, then I've talked to two people at once without having to say, to say spots one and two or John and Jim. I can just say singer. Likewise, I can say guitar, bass. So the person is put on the bass player, they're on bass all evening, and every time I say bass, they remember to answer to that name. Also, you can add groups into the mix. So the person knows their given name, they know their role and how I'm going to address them specifically, but also a group like the guitars group. Maybe I have two guitar players and a bass player on stage. I will often combine them all into one group called guitars. So if I have two spots on each of them, that's six people with one word. Stand by guitars to bump to black. Makes it a lot easier. The numbers, I find, are useful. Um, often a guy will climb up to his spot, spot, spot location, get on the comm and say, hi, spot two checking in. And I'm like, well, you know, I would number the lights maybe differently than you have labeled them in this venue, so your spot two doesn't mean anything. I'm going to call you by your name or by the group or whatever, but those numbers can be useful to the techs or other people in the building if they're, if they're having trouble and they're trying to get their steward on the intercom or uh, the master electrician or other crew member at uh, Dimmer Beach needs to speak to a follow spot of a comm problem they, they're having, their, their neighbor might be having, referring to them by the numbers that they are most comfortable with is, is a good way to do it. So with all these Using words instead of numbers from my end allows everybody to respond to more than one name and uh, for me to be able to group the lights differently. Let me give you, I'm going to give you an example, a live example of a spot call I used to make using numbers before I got into this groups thing. And this was a moment where there was one bar where all the spots would go to black little strobey thing would happen on stage, and then one bar later, they would all come back in, all in different frames than they were before. So that call went like this. Next queue is all spots bump to black. On a second and separate queue, all spots will return, bumping in with spots three and seven in color frame number one, all other spots in color frame number four. And I'd repeat that whole thing, and then the actual call would go stand by to black ready and go return ready and go and i almost i had such good experience with that you know it it, it worked but i if i didn't start calling that whole thing about four bars behind that one little moment in the stage would just be blown because one guy would stay on not really understand they come back in the wrong frames so using groups you can say singer frame one guitars frame six and then you've addressed a lot of other people. Uh, so grouping your spots allows you to be more um, textured and complicated without being as verbose. Before the show starts, you got to lay out the game plan. Uh, as I, I'm going to mention soon, I'm going to talk about North American operators, you're dealing with a new team every night. You're meeting five, eight, seven different people every night. So there's a, a briefing that has to happen. And there is some discussion as to whether this briefing should happen in person or just over the comm. Sometimes you'll have um, a tour will have the master electrician or the lighting crew chief brief the follow spots. And then that's backed up when the lighting, when the LD gets on comm. So they never meet the LD face to face. They only hear a professional voice at the other end of the comm. I see merit in these different approaches. Uh, I have been on tours, though, where I felt it better to gather everybody at a meeting just after dinner, before doors, or just before the show, and uh, do something like this uh, little stick figure drawing that I, that I have on the stage here. I found that that engaged people, and they, I get their attention because they'd start scratching their heads, what's this guy doing writing these, these little 
stick figures out and stuff like that. Well, here I would I had a chance to map out, and I might come with the uh, spot positions of those boxes already drawn and then fill them in and say, hey, what's your name? And what's your name? Okay, you're gonna respond to the word singer. And I, they could see this visually, and it's happening in a nice semi-formal way. You know, it's formal enough that we're having a meeting, but I'm drawing little stick figures and just trying to get the, 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 the mood to change so that I'm getting them on my side. Um, I might, uh, in this meeting, also warn of very specific moments during the show. You might have a show where you require a very tight headshot. You pretty much want to warn the person who has to do that headshot well before it's happening in the show. And hopefully, they will be able to uh, remember back to that meeting in the split second of the show. It gives them a fighting chance. So now we get to the cadence. The cadence is the call. I gave you an example earlier there. Um, when I spoke to Ben Richards about this, because I really learned a lot from him and the way he calls very in a very detailed fashion, he said that he was taught to always live in the future. You're always in the future. And what's happening when the guy actually does what you've asked him to do, the moment's already passed. When I call the word go, I gotta be thinking about the next cue right away, especially if you have a very tightly cued show with a lot of moves. I try to make sure that each cue is called twice. I say, look, if you missed it the first time, I'm gonna say it again. If you miss it the second time, then please pay more attention. If I can do it a third time, depending on, on the feel of the show and the pace of the song, I might do that as well. But the key is to knowing how far, the key is knowing how far to back time your, your call so that you don't have to rush it because you waited too long to start saying, Next cue is singer bump to black and guitar is switched to color frame number three. Um, in the middle of a song, you might have to speak really quickly to get all of the words out. So you have to start in the future. Um, I also stress to operators to go on the word go. I will take great care not to use a word like slow or show or Merlot that rhymes with go during the show. <laughs> There I go again, during the performance, um, so that there's no confusion. And when I say, please wait for the word go, that way I can make all the mistakes. If the spot cue was late, well, at least it was my fault. That's not to say that I don't like a little help if my performer runs off stage while I'm looking at the guitar player and the performers run off stage to get a drink of water and there's a guy trying to light him up in Monitor Beach. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind when the spots override me a little bit. But generally, you want to have the habit of, owning all of what's happening and if the operator is waiting for that word go each time then there's one one person in charge of, of making it all happen together um, i gave you that example of a call earlier the other my absolute favorite thing i think that doesn't happen in every show uh, is what i call the heart stopping blackout uh, brad will definitely remember this from metallica shows uh, the genesis of it, and this is where I heard, uh, saw it for the first time. It was a blackout with strobes, but in the song one, there's the moment where the, there's, there's these breaks in between the guitar solos, and it's and the strobes are going off. This was the beginning of really powerful strobes used like this. Metallica always had the biggest, brightest strobes. And the LD would have to call all the spots to black, all the spots return over and over and over again through a very fast paced section of the song and each time your heart just stops and then all the lights would come back in and sometimes i would see uh, butch or john broderick call the spots a little bit early before they hit the button on the console so all the guys would illuminate before the rest of the look would come in uh, this always works and if there's a place in your show where the song goes along and there's some silence or something like this it's great to have that heart stopping blackout um, Operators in North America. I wanted to talk about the differences around the planet a little bit. Uh, you have a new team, as I mentioned, at every venue. You have to treat them with respect. You have to get them on your side. They are not necessarily invested in your show. They're invested, hopefully, in being a professional follow spa operator, which means having some experience, knowledge of how the light works, and a willingness to pay attention for an hour in a row and listen to me. 
I, in turn, want to give them the most clean and concise spot call that I can. If one of us has a bad night, the advantage of this paradigm is the fact that I'll get a whole new team on the next on the next go. Um, but uh, I think the advantage of this is it gives the locals a chance to participate in the show in more than just a moving boxes from A to B way, like being part of the actual run of the show. I think that's a really important relationship that I, that's important to maintain with the local venues. Um, yeah, in direct contrast to this, we have the European model. Generally, your truck and bus drivers become your follow spot operators. So you might have four follow spot positions and seven drivers on the tour. They'll rotate in and out of these positions uh, from night to night. Uh, you might have one guy that's going to deal with uh, who's going to be on your spots and wrangling all the, they get paid extra to do this. Um, so you become the, the the team, the touring team gels in this way. Uh, you certainly can't uh, <laughs> let the heat of the moment allow you to be uh, overly terse or, or even or slightly rude in the moment, because you're going to have to deal with this person on the tour. You'll see them in catering, and they might be uh, driving your bus that keeps you alive to the next venue. Uh, not that it's pleasant to be, not that it's okay to be rude ever, I'm just saying sometimes you can be a little bit forceful in the heat of the moment. Especially me, I'm a, I, maintaining calm is um, important in the job, and it's one of my biggest challenges because I'm a pretty on-the-go kind of guy, and I like to be enthusiastic and passionate. And sometimes that leads to um, words that come out a little bit wrong. I'm always quick to apologize whether I'm in the EU or North America, because I need them for the whole show. On the EU, you need them for the whole tour. The disadvantage of using these guys, unfortunately, is it can lead to complacency, both from them and you. You know, they think they know the show and then something slightly different happens and they're just not ready for it. Or they start taking their own cues and because they're so good at it, you as the LD might stop calling the cues because you just know it's gonna happen. And then for some reason, there's a different guy on that spot the next night who hasn't run that position before. They don't know the show as well. All of a sudden, you, you forgot, to, forgot to keep calling the show. So uh, it can lead to complacency, but it's, it's part of a really fun European tour. And then operators around the world. Um, in the EU, you might have uh, uh, big festivals. Uh, they, there was one tour where we were in the EU, and we only had two trucks. We were uh, uh, just doing basically, we had two separate backline setups, and that fit into two trucks and a bit of set, no lighting package, uh, and no tour buses because we were flying to, between most gigs. So we only had two drivers on the call. Generally, the festivals would have operators for us to use, but sometimes on that tour, we would have a locally provided show, a one-off that I might have described in the last couple of webinars, um, where um, you would be doing your own show, and I might get my full complement of eight spots on this particular tour. Now, these operators, not only, because truckers would, would generally run the follow spots for these tours, these operators generally didn't have any experience running a rock show, and moreover, they didn't really understand that role in the show. They might be running a follow spot at a corporate event where they just called on every once in a while or um, in different circumstances that aren't so time sensitive and aren't so much of a performance. So uh, I found that I would have to uh, manage my expectations and maybe simplify some of the calls. Sacrifice one really awesome lighting thing for one that's almost as good but easier to accomplish so you know you're going to pull it off each day with different people. Um, when you go outside of EU and not everybody learns English as a second language, like when you're uh, in Asia and other far-flung parts of the world, you start to run up against uh, language barriers. Very enthusiastic people all the time, definitely, uh, but you'll find yourself talking through a translator. So you might have to, uh, you will have to modify your spot calling and call the cues maybe a bit earlier. As long as though the translator is going to let them know that the word go means what it means. Um, 
I find if you narrow the vocabulary, like I was talking about earlier, if you define during your spot meeting exactly what you mean by a fade in or a fade out, exactly how big you want the iris and all that, you do that with the interpreter during the spot meeting, they'll start to come to understand your narrow vocabulary, what a fade, bump to black, the very few basic commands will get them through the show, whether they speak English at all or not. Uh, when it comes down to writing, writing their names on a map, in the one place where I just found it hilarious is in Thailand. I will always have operators, when I say, okay, what's your name? They'll give me a North American name. It'll be Steve or Jim or, or, or Bobby. And I was like, listen, I, were you born like were you born here? Is your name really Bobby? And they say no, my name is. And then they pronounce Thai word that I could not wrap my tongue around. Uh, I'm better with European languages. I try a little Japanese, but there's something about the Thai language I can never get my lips around those syllables. So that person was then Bobby again, and I would understand why they would come forward with easy to pronounce names for us English speaking North Americans. So. That's a, an interesting, you go around the world and the task is the same, but it's going to be run by very different people with different skill sets and experiences. So having talked about all of these aspects of running a fall spot where it's a light that the operator is generally 100% in control of, now we've got to talk about the automated solutions. These solutions uh, are going to be the future and uh, there's a couple of different approaches. They have varying degrees of success, but all of them, I would say, are getting very good. And when I mention the history in a few moments, you'll understand what I mean. Because this technology has been around for a long time, but there's been a lot of different ways to skin a cat. Uh, there's two basic approaches. In one approach, you have a human operator that tracks a target, whether they're holding on to some handlebars and it looks like a video camera apparatus, whether they, the unit that they're controlling is designed to feel like a follow spot, as is in the case with the ground control system, uh, or if you're uh, doing something like a follow me, where you, you're not moving an apparatus, you're moving a more video game-like control to follow, uh, to put crosshairs on a person through a camera view. All these uh, solutions require the operator to be looking at a camera and often that camera can be mounted like in the robo spot right on the fixture and on the ground control unit. You could also use a separate pan tilt camera in certain systems uh, and that XYZ positioning can be made available to several fixtures. Um, so there, that, that's one approach. Another approach is uh, to have the uh, target, the, the performer, where some sort of apparatus that identifies them somehow on stage. So Black Tracks uses a system like this, um, that uh, there's little tiny LED uh, infrared emitters. If you go to their website, you can see all the different sensors that they have that are designed to be sewn into costumes or mounted onto um, you know, they can be put on, the, on a hat or mounted to a guitar strap so that you can uh, identify that object in 3D space. Uh, I know that Justin Timberlake had, uh, had sensors mounted in his in-ears. So pretty much anywhere he turned his head, his sensors were being picked up by one of the receivers in, in the rig. The disadvantage, I think, to this system is it's not quite as versatile in the moment. To follow someone, you have to get this object on them. So whether or not you have a wrangler that's ready to slap a, a little dot on someone's shoulder because Jay-Z is guesting that night or the, the um, uh, artist has brought someone up from the, from the crowd and wants a spotlight on them, uh, in a system with the human operator following, that's a more easy task to accomplish. Uh, with a uh, follow me, with a system like Black Tracks, it makes that process a little bit more difficult to accomplish. Um, but if you have a tightly cued pop show or any, the, the thing about Black Tracks is it feeds that position information to way more than just lighting fixtures. It identifies it so that the projectors know where you are and can be expanded to, to interface with automation systems uh, to identify objects on the stage. So Black Tracks, the, the, the target hitting a sensor approach really opens up a new realm of possibilities. 
There's one solution that I found in my research that I haven't seen in the wild yet, but I would love to see this. It's called the uh, Spot Me System by Robert Julia. Uh, and so I know nothing, I have no experience with this system, but the concept's pretty fascinating to me. You point one follow spot traditionally at your target, but the act of doing that provides XYZ uh, information that can be calibrated to be shared with a bunch of different lighting fixtures on stage. So this way you could always keep that local human operator in the loop because the system appears to me to be passive. I'd like to get more specs on it before I make any more comments on it. But the idea that one follow spot operator can give their information to automated fixtures in the rig, I think is fascinating. So we'll see how that pans out and we'll see if any other manufacturers adopt this approach. Martin, what do you got? I forgot to put it in the system, in, in, in the, uh, uh, Brad, I apologize. I didn't get a slide in there with the old track pod, but Martin did have a system that relied on one person shooting at the stage and a laser uh, would calibrate the system. Uh, it was similar to the systems that we have now. It wasn't quite as advanced to the point that the RoboSpot got to, but uh, nonetheless, a fascinating idea that we had in the mid-90s. But what else do we have in the mid 90s? Well, I have experience with the good old Wybrun Autopilot. And this was the first system like this that I'm aware of. Feel free to chime in in the Q&A or comments or whatever about some other system. But this was a system that was commercially available in about 1995. I used it on two separate tours and it didn't last the whole tour for two very different reasons. Um, but there was one thing about the autopilot that kept it from being widely adopted, I believe. We'll set aside for a moment the fact it was fairly complicated to set up. Um, the, uh, the red rectangular boxes there that you see are the uh, receivers. The, they would flood the stage with infrared light and the sensor had an infrared receiver that would identify and say, oh, I see some red, some infrared light. Now I'm going to chirp ultrasound. And if you look at the red rectangle there, there's a little silver dot in the bottom left corner of each one of those receivers. That, if you got up close, it looked like a microphone. It was a little graded microphone, and that was an ultrasonic micro microphone. So it used uh, ultrasound, which is inaudible to the human ear. It's not a radio frequency. It's, it was a really elegant solution, I think. As long as you had line of sight to three of these receivers, of which you could have eight, eight would plug into the system, and that would cover pretty much any size normal amphitheater or arena stage. Um, you had this system that it would chirp back ultrasound, it would echolocate, and man, this thing was accurate. It seemed to work perfectly. It would even change the beam size. If you were further away from, from one receiver, it would know that certain fixtures at the distance might want to iris down to maintain the same beam size as the person moved around the stage. Fascinating. What was the Achilles heel, though? Why didn't it become the thing? It was the hi-hat. The hi-hat in any drum kit would fool the system. If the drummer played tight with those cymbals together, no problem. If the drummer moved over and, and started riding on a cymbal, the bell of a cymbal, no problem. Those cymbals, they just audible overtones were not in the, in, in the same range as the autopilot. But when the cymbals sloshed together like this, it created overtones. And that's how a lot of drummers play, like that. So all of a sudden, whenever that happened, your system would stop working. It would freeze wherever it was, and then as soon as the drummer tightened up that hi-hat or moved to a different symbol or stopped playing, the lights would just slam into position and follow like there was nothing wrong. I remember hearing about different tours that used this, and they would try plexiglass all around the hi-hat in different locations and moving the drummer further upstage and all these kinds of things, but it just never worked 100% of the time. This was the problem on one tour, and that's why we stopped using it on the, that particular tour. I was on a different tour with less sloshing of hi-hats where it worked very well, but the performer himself did not like the system so much because he felt like he was wearing yet another pack on him. And he just, he was a very funny guy. 
uh, he came out the front of the house in front of 5,000 people and handed me the receiver and said, look, it's nothing personal. I just don't want to wear this extra thing. We'll just use the old-fashioned follow spots. So for various reasons, the autopilot didn't work. But, man, it was cutting edge at the time, and uh, it, was, it was quite an interesting system. Setting it up was very tedious, and I know this because I did it on one of the tours, that handheld remote was lifted straight from industrial machinery. So it was a, a, a generic keypad. It had no encoders or a joystick or anything. You had to push, you know, press membrane keys one at a time to move your light, move your light, and train them on three separate positions. And the positions had to be measured out perfectly. And then you had to come back uh, and resolve to the same point. And if something went wrong in one of those things, the, the system, in one of those steps, the system would make you start from the beginning. You couldn't even back up, as I recall. So it was a very tedious system to, to set up. But when it worked, it worked. So the future of the follow spot operator. Like it or not, automation is here to stay. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how we, uh, emerge from this COVID thing and start doing shows again, if uh, LDs such as myself, operators, uh, stagehands are going to have time to research some of these systems and become familiar with these systems so that we can keep the locals integrated and so that more people decide to use the automated systems. Instead of the, super, the ubiquitous super trooper, you're going to see more spaces where uh, you have a production manager looking for, in the, or a stage manager walking through a venue, okay, here's where the dead cases go, and here's where Video Village is gonna go today, and over there's where we're gonna put all the spot controller things. That will be a thing, it already is on many tours. And having said that, I was speaking with my friend Jeff Farrow, who uh, is the house LD at uh, Fallsview Casino in Niagara Falls, Ontario. Uh, they just built a brand new uh, uh, venue that had yet to open before COVID, so they're just itching to get into the space, and they bought eight brand new Robert Juliet follow spots. They, just, they did a cost benefit analysis on trying to get robo spots and all this, and they just made the decision that it was cost prohibitive. It was better just to buy follow spots and hire guys to run them. So uh, I think that's uh, an interesting step, and hopefully um, it'll pan out for them. Regardless, I think, you know, moving a follow spot around is, is hard. Follow spots deserve a lot of respect, and I understand their pain. I've run follow, front of house follow spots and trust spots, and I've gone up into the spot locations in arenas and amphitheaters all over North America, all over the world, in fact, just because I love these lights so much. So I went through a phase where I would go up and, physic and personally tune each follow spot, check them out, make sure they worked, and then tell the steward, hey, maybe we can get a new lamp in this one, or this one needs some service. Um, so I play with these lights, and I know what I'm asking for. It's, it's, it's easy to move back and forth, but a big object like a super trooper, to tilt it up is not always the easiest thing. And to create a fluid head like you have on a, uh, on a video camera, even a long lens video camera is not that heavy. I can lift it up myself. You need help to lift a, a super trooper. There's a lot of inertia there. And I've always wondered why the, the stands aren't kind of better and more fluid. And I realized the engineering and the expense that would have to go into that would probably triple the cost of the follow spot because it's a large, heavy beast. So I think the follow spot operator deserves more respect than they ever get. I think that they should understand uh, their role. I've always said during my spot meetings, every night, I will say, look, if I have four follow spots and the PA is still on, we could lose power to the whole lighting rig, and there's still a show going on. And I think that's important. It's, it's the, the light that identifies the people of the crowd. They came there to see their heroes' faces. Um, some artists like Nine Inch Nails or Tool, you know, Tool famously, um, Maynard has a little platform in the back, and he all dark and maybe a video projector on his face is about as bright as he gets. That's one kind of show. But for the most part, you need the ability to front light your artist. And the follow spot operator is a very important part. They are part of the team. They are as important as anybody can be during the run of that show. They have a show call. And personally, I'd like to see them still in the loop. Now, with the new systems, though, 
the skill set might change from handling a large follow spot to more gamer uh, based. Uh, I can see with the follow me approach, more kids that are used to first person shooters uh, having a better time using thumbsticks instead of a crazy apparatus. And I know from trying to play Call of Duty with my kids that uh, they definitely develop these skills from an early age. So maybe the younger generation will uh, have the skill set that it takes to run the follow spots of the future. Uh, with that, I'm going to say thanks very much and peace to everybody. I got to say thanks a lot to uh, Benoit Richard, otherwise known as Ben Richards, for speaking to me for an hour and a half, and Butch Allen as well for lending their thoughts and reinforcing some old ideas, giving me some new ones that have made their way into this uh, presentation. Thanks to Jeff Farrow, who I talked about earlier. He's the guy that I always rehearse this webinar with before I do it for you. And uh, thanks again for listening. Thanks to Lauren Brad, as always. Thanks to Mallory for keeping everything running on time. And thank you very much for those who are tuning in right now. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks for watching in the future. And with that, Laura, open up the floor. Right. Thank you, AJ. Um, we do have some questions. So the first one is asking, do you find it helpful for ops to answer standbys, or do you take it for granted they are ready? Do you ever want to hear from them? In, my, in all of my context so far, no. I'd rather that the only reason that they key their mic is if they're having a physical problem, whether it's medical or whether they're having a problem with the light and they need to let someone know. I will assume that you're paying attention, and I will know if you're not paying attention because you don't, didn't operate that cue. Uh, again, I'm dealing with concert touring, so I'm dealing with songs where there might be several cues, there might be 15 cues or 20 cues in one song. So uh, if, with that kind of repetition, they're going to be paying attention. But I don't need them to chime in, uh, and most LDs prefer that you don't recognize each standby because it's just kind of assumed. And the next question, what do you find worse, the total beginner or the know-it-all, and how do you advise handling both? Okay, easy. It's the know-it-all. Uh, the best follow spot operator in North America is named Angel, and he works at, I'm, and I apologize to everybody else, but this guy just loves the craft so much, and he's not a know-it-all. He's an experienced person. For every guy with that much experience that is as lovely as Angel, he works at Jones Beach, uh, it, the, uh, there is that guy that's just like, yeah, whatever, I've seen enough shows, I don't care. And that's what I'm talking about. You don't have to like my artist's music, but I'm hoping that you like the act of trying to make their show good. The know-it-all really becomes a hindrance. The eager beginner, as long as they have a, a reasonable command of the English language that I'm speaking at the time, if they have opposable thumbs and if they are paying attention, they're going to get good by the end of the show. And that's, I, that's because the LD should be able to give the absolute beginner every tool, every uh, advantage to, to uh, have a good show. Okay, next question. As an LD, do you consider using an automated tracking system a risk for the show, seeing that the responsibility often comes down to the LD? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I would say that for sure. Um, I used uh, RoboSpot in multi-fixture mode recently, uh, last summer. And uh, it, was, it was a good chance to try it out because my artist had a fairly, he just walked the Marley. He didn't go uh, upstage more than once during the show. Um, and uh, I only had one position, so we had one system controlling four lights. So I had total control both in the cue list and also as additives and inhibitives where I could balance that, that, uh, the, the front and back light level uh, differently if I had to. Uh, it was just pure joy to press the button and see that guy illuminate because I knew that my man, little G, Greg Kukurik, was following him all night long. Risk? Definitely. I, I, I felt the pressure. I'm like, well, now I don't have, you know, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, as the LD, you're owning the follow spot show anyway, especially if they go on the word go, then I'm the person making all the mistakes. Uh, but yeah, there, there is a risk that you take on too much, but there's the same risk. I mean, when you time code a show, your show is going to suffer if the time code signal gets lost for a moment. 
there's, there's always a trade-off when you trust anything to technology. I think that because we have so much history of technology and lighting now, it's easier to incorporate these things, uh, these newer technologies as they go. And I think, uh, yeah, in 20 years, it's choosing which photo spot system is going to be the same as choosing which lighting fixture you want to use. All right, next question. Do you think putting a spotlight operator in some random closet across the venue will affect performance better or worse? I just think we'll learn how to deal with it. It'll become a skill. Like I said, the gamers are going to have an advantage. Uh, it was Butch that pointed out, uh, I, I haven't had great experience with follow me until the operator got really comfortable with the system and really comfortable with the show. So using a local wasn't the greatest idea when the follow me situation. But then Butch pointed out to me that if they asked in advance, if the production manager said, we need four people with video game skills that were really good gamers, they didn't need to know anything about the follow spot. They would be able to make that disassociation. And we're learning, I mean, the fact that I'm doing this webinar right now means we're learning to do things via remote control. So will it suffer? It might suffer when compared to a traditional way of doing things in the short term, but in the long term, I think we're just going to get used to that. And you're going to start to have, okay, dressing room five is going to be, oh, it's big enough for six spot locations, run a wire in there, and that's how it's going to go. Okay, next one is saying, uh, the history of follow spots was fascinating. Have you used any of the new LED-based follow spots? What is your opinion of that technology? I have not. And furthermore, I haven't really researched LED-based follow spots. Um, to me, the follow spots are still made by Strong and Lycian and have big old uh, bulbs in them. In the rest of my rig, I have decided to make a plunge and make everything work with LEDs. I like a high-powered, good-quality LED source over an HMI um, in most circumstances uh, for the automated lights in my rig. But I have not had a chance to use uh, LEDs-based follow spots, nor did I really research them for this. Uh, so, unfortunately, I don't have much of an answer for that one. Okay, next question. Um, do you think, or I'm sorry, does the introduction of IP rated moving heads change your perspective on using fixtures closer to the stage with no covering? Uh, yes. Um, interesting. It's not exactly on topic, but if you're using an IP rated fixture as a follow spot, it's great. Um, I really think that that should be the move for all theatrical lighting fixtures. Um, is just getting these, it's, it seems to be easier and easier for them to do, and it's a feature that I think people should pay for to have, to not have to worry about which fixtures are going to be going outside. So it, in 15 years from now, everything's rated to a point that they can get wet and, and not, it's, it's a huge investment that you put out there. Why are we covering them up still with trash bags? Just to just to keep them safe. Why you know why isn't that a, a thing? Or the the bubbles that they have to go into. I mean it works, but they you know it doesn't doesn't look great. So um, yes, I think IP rated fixtures. Uh, it's they make a <laughs> they provide a distinct advantage, and um, I think that uh, I, I would always want to get lights where they haven't been before because the weather was too bad. All right, next question is asking, do you think we might start seeing Spotlight from home systems so we can get back to gigs live with no crowd? I'm not going to say I, I, I can't imagine that. You know, uh, I um, am working on a project for a live stream later this month where uh, we're not going to rely on me being the lighting operator, but we are going to open up the pathway where I have uh, the shows in L.A. and I'm in Toronto and I'm going to be um, having access to the lighting console remotely. Uh, I don't think that that would work so great because of latency for queuing, and I think someone needs to be in the room still. But uh, going by that logic, that I'm willing to try this out <laughs> as a lighting operator, I think that with the follow me based uh, camera based systems, maybe the operators uh, might be staying home in the future. Can't rule it out. Uh, next question, do you, do you expect that the union will push back against the automated systems due to losing jobs? Aha. I mentioned several times about how I like to keep the locals in, but I did, I, now that I realize I did not say this thing that I was saying last summer. 
and we'll continue. Every time I use an automated follow, system, follow spot system, and I'm addressing the follow spots I do have, i.e., last summer we still had two front of house spots on the call, A for backup, and B because we had a B stage moment that I needed their, their lighting angle just to light the stage properly. So um, every night I would say, hey guys, you might notice that we have a roadie running the artist's follow spots tonight with an automated system. I think that you should go to your union steward or your business agent and say, why aren't we getting training on these things? Because if you could go through a training course and have a little ticket or something that says, yep, I know how this system works. I'm certified on X, Y, and Z systems, or this local support you know, will provide an operator that knows these several different systems, then we can keep the jobs local. I do expect there's always been pushback. I mean, back in the day, there's it's legendary that as soon as the very light came out, people said, "Oh, this is gonna take away our trust spot jobs," and you can't. And everybody's afraid of automation. But it's just like we're looking at driverless cars, and you know, we've had uh, driverless subway systems, planes land themselves. It, things we can't be afraid of automation. It's it's how to make it work to your advantage. So I like the, that's why personally I prefer a hybrid system of some sort where the human operator is still required. Um, but yeah, we're gonna see pushback for sure. All right, we have a bunch more questions coming in here. Uh, well, do, you, uh, do unions accept remote systems whereby each performer requires an operator, but we give each operator multiple fixtures, thus still keeping the operator? Um, okay, uh, I'm uh, I'm parsing that question because it kind of asks a couple of different things there. Um, I I can't speak for the unions. I don't see how they could reasonably decide that because three or four lights are firing at the same target that they can't be operated by one person using one of these systems. I it it just uh, Artistically, I can't imagine that four separate people on four separate automated systems are going to be able to keep that looking anything nice and tight, unless you want a loose system. It's hard enough for two people that are pointing their lights uh, at the same person to keep from figuring out who they're, you know, if they're really on the, the right target. Um, but I would support anyone who says that, yes, for each performer that needs to be followed on stage, you have a separate operator, and that operator uh, is a local person. Uh, just speaking further on the on the local thing, the only local in, uh, I, I, on the, in, the, in North America that insisted on their own operator was Chicago uh, when we were using a follow me system. Uh, it was an upstaging rig, so the person that usually ran the follow, the follow me actually knew the stagehand. They both lived in Chicago. He knew the stagehand that was going to uh, cover him that night. Uh, but they wouldn't accept just a shadow person on the call and let the roadie do his thing. They needed the, their guy doing it. It worked the same for climbing the rig. Chicago is the only place that I never climbed to focus park hands, for instance. Um, and the, the exact thing, the, the exact drawback of the follow me system was apparent right away. Not, the, the person that ran it had experience using follow me, but not so much with our setup and where our performer was and knowing our performer's habits. And that's what our roadie was able to learn. Uh, I think that with the, the gaming skills and, and, and tapping people, training people in different ways will uh, eventually make that follow me system a bit better in that regard. But that time and every time that I've had an operator that was using the system for the first or second time and had never seen my show trying to run follow me, they had a lot of trouble sticking with the target. So I, I think that it's a system that requires practice. I think I got off the question there. I hope I answered the person's question in some way. Okay, the next question is, what color temperature do you balance your spots to and what do you base your decision on? Um, it varies. Uh, given my druthers, my default is to put a um, quarter CTO 
And generally, I like a, a quarter minus green as well, uh, especially when you get up with a with a Lycian M2 follow spot. They have a lot of green in their uh, their light, so a little bit of minus green helps that. But live, I like a slightly warmer tone on the face, but not so warm that it's going to throw the cameras out of whack. And then we generally balance IMAG at about 4,500 Kelvin. And it works out well that way. I get the best balance. There is an argument to take the correction out and balance high so that IMAG matches real life on wide shots. I get that. Uh, there's an argument that you, if you want a warmer look, put, put a warmer face in there. Um, I tend to stay away from uh, the pink flesh tones. Uh, unless you choose the right color and it matches well with the spot, you can have people looking just way too pink. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in general, um, now they asked about color temperature. So uh, the, the decision as, as to where to balance and how to balance the spots is not a steadfast only decision. I like to uh, incorporate the video director and see how they're going to shoot the shot and what, what we can get away with vis-a-vis -vis that balance so that I can warm up the follow spot face for the live audience while still maintaining good color for the um, for video and IMAG. And that is always a balancing act. Okay, next question. Do you memorize all your spot calls or follow a list in a notebook or on your console? Ah, one of the slides I, lay, I left out was uh, how I have my my sequence view on the Grand MA. I put the spot cues in there um, so that someone else that might have to run the show for me can see them. But also, I don't have enough space in my head for that. Uh, Benoit will disagree with me on that one. He likes to have the whole thing up there so he doesn't have to glance down very often. I try to make the font nice and big so I only have to glance down a little bit. And yes, you do, by muscle memory, you get to know the songs uh, the more you do a show. But definitely when I'm learning my own show, when we're starting out and things may have changed, I need uh, a reference. And I put it, I use the console to its advantage. I put the notes right in the, um, right in the sequence view, whatever console it is, generally MA2. Um, I have used a notebook in the past that, that, and a music stand that it, it, when you're calling a fast-paced rock show and you have two hands on the console, that becomes difficult to do. Uh, not that it hasn't been used by a lot of people. So it takes different ways to skin a cat, but personally, I can't keep the whole show in there without that security blanket of knowing I can look down and double check my work uh, with the, some sort of list on the screen. Okay, next question. Do you use a system with your headset so you can hear the show and make your spot calls? Some LDs, such as Ben Richards, have a complex setup. I do. I do indeed. And um, yeah, I, I purposely, that's, that can be a whole other discussion that goes to uh, what kind of delay you would put in your ear mix and all, and light traveling faster than sound and stuff. That uh, without diving deep, I'm going to touch on that, that whole idea. Um, my system is not as complicated as Ben's. I know he uses uh, a noise gate, so it's a, it's a pedal of some sort, so that when he stops speaking, it's dead silent. It basically shuts off his mic. Um, I have uh, procured a very good headset that I wear over top of my ears with a really good noise-canceling mic. The next step, I think, is to get a, a lower-profile mic because I have good isolation in my ears. But uh, the ear mix, for NELD is a webinar in itself, I think. Um, I have in my ear mix, I have the what's going to the PA, I have the click track, and to the left, so it's easy to ignore and easy to find. And then I have a little mixer that puts the intercom into my ear mix. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work with the new digital systems, but pretty much any old, sis, old school uh, clearcom system, uh, there's a little box that removes the pin, the power off one of the pins that feeds the belt packs, so it's a pure audio signal, and that goes straight into my ear mix. I also have a separate feed with the bands, the, the, the uh, backline talkback system. So I can pick up a microphone instead of keying your radio, and I can talk directly to monitors and backline people and anyone who is on that talkback channel, and I can hear what's going on backstage. I use the mixer to pan that to the right and the spots to the left. 
So if I hear something in my left ear, I know it's a follow spot operator trying to get my attention. And if I hear something in my right ear, I know it's my guys. And I can turn either one up or down if I want to tune them out or tune into them. Um, now, with regards to delay, I'll go over that real quick. You, different people in an arena, there's no way around this, have a fundamentally different perspective on your show. And they are going to hear it and see it at different times based on how far the way, the, away they are from the stage. This is basic physics. There are artists that insist that the light has to track exactly in real time with what they're doing to the millisecond. Unfortunately, the further you get away from the stage, the more the show suffers. And I find that that leads to a disconnected feel. So if able to, I will have the conversation with my artist and say, look, the lights are gonna always be a little bit late on stage for you because I'm timing the light show to more or less the, the sweet spot, the middle of everything. If there are more people in front of me than behind me. I might either change my delay so that my the audio is arriving in my ears slightly before it's arriving from the PA. And that puts my ears virtually ahead of me. Or I might just choose to play a little bit ahead of the beat so that that sweet spot of people that are seeing the exact light show in time with the music is as big as it can be. When you get closer to the stage, there's a fundamental difference to the, the, the experience. You are seeing the beads of sweat on the performer's face. You are feeling that much closer to the actual stage that the light show is going over your head. We put on that big light show to increase the drama for the larger number of people in the stadium uh, or the arena. People close to the stage aren't getting that. So if the lights are a little late to them, they're not gonna notice as much. But when you are at front of house and the show happens either before or after you hear it, and you're, you're in a sweet spot that should be where things are happening. So uh, Ben uses a delay in his system that he sets himself. I work with the audio guy because they calculate distance to front of house and for time aligning PA anyway. So I get them to use that number and put my ears in time with the PA. The exception being, if we know that it's being recorded, or live broadcast so that the audience is much greater than the people in the room. In those circumstances, I will want the show to happen exactly when it comes out the artist's mouth <laughs> because I know that the people that will be enjoying it outside of the arena are a much larger audience and it's gonna be really off if, that, if, if, I don't, if I'm not playing perfectly in time with uh, the, the audio. So I hope that kind of encapsulates the idea of Every LD should use an ear mix, even if it's just so you hear the music better. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information. I, I joke that my version of time code is a good ear mix where I can choose what I'm listening to and it's informing my brain, which in turn informs the follow spots. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, when you have a terrible spot operator, how do you fire them or do you just tell them to turn off their spot? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, no, no excuse for being rude. And although you can fly off the handle in the moment, uh, you'll be apologizing it for it later. If the follow spots, uh, if you have control over the breakers of the follow spots, sometimes you can just create a little not happening. Other times, yes, I have had, had to ask a follow spot operator who was suspended in a trust spot location above front of house and they just, they, they weren't cutting it. We breakered them off and that guy had to just sit there watching the whole time. Um, if you have a really bad follow spot operator, hopefully you have specced one more follow spot than you need. I like to have an extra follow spot on the call. So if I have one guy that needs to be follow spotted, I have two follow spots. That way you can give each one a break and if one explodes, the other guy's gonna work while they're sorting out their problem. Um, so yeah, the... Um, if someone's just not cutting it, it's it's best to gently ask them to sit it out if it's come to that. If you can make them have a, a problem uh, that just turns off their light, eh, you know, they can save a little face. All right, one last question. Um, how do you balance and check spots before a show? 
Um, it all depends on how much time you have. Uh, generally, I want to. Uh, If the tour is very video heavy, uh, iMag heavy, you might want to get out your light meter and check the follow spots uh, and try. I went through a period where each follow spot I would be adding and subtracting sheets of ND during the day, getting them all balanced, getting them exact. Um, you don't always have time to do that and not every venue and local makes it easy for that to happen. Now, having said that, most of them will, if you say, look, at 3 o'clock, I want to look at the spots, shine them all down on the arena floor. For most shows, if you look and you see one is vastly underpowered, you can have them work on that follow spot. Uh, sometimes you, have, you can have them detune the brightest spot so that it matches the others because they're all bright enough. But uh, whatever, whatever your situation allows you to do, the pace of your day, how busy the load-in is, and how responsive the local is, can uh, affect whether or not you get to check and balance them. Uh, if you don't, though, you start the show and you're figuring out what's happening in the first few songs. So going in, advancing that, buying the time in advance is, is the way to go. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, AJ. It's always a pleasure having you present to us. Um, Thanks, so we really appreciate your time. And thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have any interest in seeing the calendar for upcoming sessions, you can check that out at pro.harman.com. And um, the recording for this will be released in a few days out on our YouTube channel. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, AJ. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, AJ. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, AJ. Good presentation.